Clean clearly. Good, wonderful. Uh, tonight we're having a wonderful debate about Psalms 2 in the Bible and was the suffering of Jesus predicted in the Old Testament. Um, the debate will be between Aki Aisi al Gahazi and uh, our dear respected guest Lou Roggs. Uh, the beginning opening statements will be five minutes, followed by nine crossfire rounds of four minutes each, followed by a, a four minute closing for each person. Lou Roggs will begin the debate with a five minute opening and then Aki Aisi al Gahazi will begin the closing with his four minute closings. There will be no question and answer rounds uh, in this debate. Uh, please refrain from flooding the text with uh, comments or, or opinions as that will distract the debaters and is not necessary. Um, please refrain from PMing either debater and those people who are posting text for the debaters, you know who you are, so please keep up with your particular debater. I believe Lou Roggs will be uh, posting for himself. So do not PM the debaters, as that will also distract them and can cause lags or slowdowns. Uh, admins, also please refrain from posting during debate. Uh, if you need something, there are whispers, and you can always PM any of the other admins. Thank you for your time, and we will begin the debate with a five-minute opening from Lou Roggs. Well, well, shalom, salam, hello everyone. I welcome everyone to the debate. My name is Louis Ruggiero. I'm a Christian author and apologist. Uh, I'm taking the position that uh, Psalm chapter 2 is not about David. Psalm chapter 2 is about the Messiah, Jesus Christ. I'm also taking the position that the Bible teaches and foretells that the Messiah would suffer and die for our sins. Uh, throughout the most of this debate, I'll be focusing on Isaiah chapter 53 and a number of other verses and passages in the Old Testament uh, to prove my point. Uh, let's, let's begin for the record. That's the spelling of my name, Louis Ruggiero, R-U-G-G-I-E-R-O, for the record. Uh, let's go to Psalm chapter 2 and begin. Uh, for the sake of time, I'll begin in verse 6. Psalm chapter 2, verse 6. This is what it says in Psalm chapter 2, verse 6. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree, verse 7, the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. This, ver this passage speaks about God's begotten son, the king. Now, is this about David or is this about the Messiah? Well, I believe that the Bible teaches very clearly that this is about the Messiah and not about David. Reason being, David did not meet the qualifications of the next two verses. Psalm 2.8 says, Ask of me. And I, will give you, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. David never asked of it. David never received it. Also, in verse 9, this is what it says. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. David never did that to the nations, but the Messiah would. Now, let me show everybody that according to Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 through 14, the Messiah would receive the uttermost parts of the earth for his possession. This is what it says in Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. I'll send it over. This is what Daniel wrote. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Zechariah chapter 9 verse 10 regarding the Messiah. He will receive a kingdom from sea to sea, from the ends of the earth to the other ends of the earth. That's what it says in Zechariah chapter 9 verse 10. Uh, also, uh, he will crush the nations like a potter's vessel. How do I know that the Messiah would accomplish this? Well, go to Daniel chapter 2, verses 39 through 44, which gives Daniel's interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's vision of a great statue. This is what Daniel wrote in Daniel chapter 2, verses 39 through 44. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and in another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. Verse 40. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces, and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. Verse 41. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes 
part of potter's clay and part of iron. That's the final kingdom. The kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of it the strength of the iron. Thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. Verse 42. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. Look what happens in verse 43 and 44. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is mixed with miry clay. Verse 44. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. This is the final kingdom that's prophesied in the book of Daniel chapter 2. Which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall, look at this, break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. This is the messianic reign which will break in pieces the kingdoms of the earth. For as much as thou sawest that the stone, that's the Messiah, was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay. Notice the potter's clay, the silver, the gold, the great God had made known to the king, which shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain. Notice the parallel in verse here. Daniel chapter 2, verse 45, the final kingdom, the Messiah's reign, will break in pieces the kingdoms of the earth. Now let's go back to Psalm chapter 2, verse 9. Look what it says. Thou shalt dash them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. The Messiah, the messianic reign, will break in pieces the kingdoms of the earth. My time is up. Aisa, you're up. Thank you, Lou. Uh, as a former Christian, I've had ample opportunity to examine and analyze the positions concerning Christian theological thinking. This is an open new statement, by the way, not debate right now. And to observe the most rabid devotion Christian apologists have for trying to prove that their religion and its tenets are true, all while flying in the face of proven scholarly evidence to the contrary of their position. Unfortunately, this denial of truth and insistence upon circular reasoning, intentional misinterpretation or even misrepresentation of scripture, and the practice of cherry-picking specific verses out of context to prove a theological position has led to a total confusion as to what the scriptures actually say. Quite often, a single Old Testament verse or set of verses is used to provide a evidence of something that has nothing to do with. The verse is theologically and logically disconnected from the events with thoughts being expressed, but because it relates something similar, even separated by thousands of years, the verse is used as a proof for something the Christian apologist is trying to establish as an undeniable fact. Likewise, if a passage in the New Testament says something, even though the author is separated by a thousand plus years of time from an Old Testament passage, the fact that the two sets of words have similar phraseology is said by the apologist to be a proof of the New Testament's accuracy, even though the New Testament author must most likely plagiarize the earlier work in order to add depth to his own writings. Either of these two conditions is known as circular logic. Thank you for illustrating that, Lou. The best way to stop this circular logic is to remove one or the other of the sources being brought forward as evidence and require the single source to prove its accuracy and veracity. And for the apologist to allow the single set of words to stay on its own as proof for the position that it is being put forward. This is real evidence, not circular logic, not manipulation of disconnected scripture, as Lou has just done with his nice manipulation there. Not intentional misinterpretation of a single verse or set of verses in order to normally be untenable. By asking for the evidence to substantiate itself as the only way to assure the true evidence is provided, which Lou has not done. He's given us a bunch of weird verses now. Many times we in Islam are faced with someone with good intentions trying to verify our Prophet وسلم, something in the Quran or our own jurisprudence from passages in the Torah, the Tanakh, or the Bible. Usually our position is not feasible because they do not really understand that they are using as evidence concerning Islam. I often ask them not to do this. Because when their position is examined, it is found that the scripture they are attempting to use as proofs proves nothing, as Lou has just illustrated. And in the end, actually damages their credibility. It is human nature to try to prove your belief. It is also human nature to make state mistakes and forget that the truth does not need proof. The truth stands on its own. And we all need to remember this fact when speaking of God, religion, scripture, and the actual content of our holy books.
It is disingenuous for Christian apologists to bring forth questionably misinterpreted scripture or mislinked scripture as a proof of their position, as Lou has just started doing. The divinity of the prophet Isa al Islam, a triune nation of God, or the alleged suffering on the cross, remission of sins with blood, salvation by sacrifice of the innocent, are all prime examples of how people will go to great lengths to prove something that is not true. It sounds really good, yeah, it really does, but is it true? Is it supported by the words of God? Is it necessary from God? Does God even require it of us? These are all positions brought forth from the Christian theologies, but which have no accuracy when viewed from the position of the biblical scriptures. They are made up, imagined, wished for, because they show to the apologist that their position is correct, even though the basis of them is non-existent and fallacious and even not linked together, unless you really twist things to try to make them link together. It is up to all of us to see the truth, the self-evident truth that requires no convincing, no examination, no explanation in order to be seen. I found that usually if something is written down, it says exactly what it means, and the weird interpretation to link it to something else is usually fallacious. It's true meaning. We need go no further than to honestly see what is actually said in the scripture in order to see what God the author is bringing forward for us. Muslims revere all the prophets, please remember that, from Adam a.s. to Muhammad a.s. through the entire lineage of the Old Testament prophets and messengers and their writings and words. Jesus, Isa a.s. is a prophet of God, the Messiah, the son of Mary. He was called this in the Bible. He is shown to be such in the Bible and the Muslims agree. He is the Messiah, but he didn't die for you. And our Quran examines him and all prophets to be the best of men, the best of those who brought the words of God to humanity and the laws to mankind. But remember, he is not God. And no amount of twisting scripture, as Lou has tried, can change the truth of that statement. Jesus is not God. He did not suffer for our sins or die for us. The truth is self-evident. It does not need to be explained. It just is. The mic is free. Salam alaikum. Well, the subject of this, uh, this debate isn't whether Jesus is God or not, and I'll be looking forward to my opponent uh, giving proof that, Daniel, that David satisfied Psalm 2.8 and Psalm 2.9. I'll be looking forward to that in the next few rounds. Uh, I'll show that the Messiah uh, will satisfy Psalm 2.8 and Psalm 2.9. I did that before. Uh, Psalm 2.8, he was given the heathen for his possession and the uttermost parts of the earth uh, for his inheritance. Uh, that's in Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 through 14. Uh, and he shall break the uh, kingdoms of the earth in pieces like a potter's vessel, according to Daniel chapter 2, verses 44 through 45. I'm glad to know that uh, uh, the Aisha, uh my opponent, says that uh, Islam uh, reveres the prophets. Uh, that's good, because I plan on being in the prophets all throughout the debate. And we'll show with the prophets that the Messiah satisfies Psalm chapter mm -hmm. 2 as well as Isaiah chapter 53, which Isaiah is a prophet. So uh, I'll be looking forward to uh, Aisha uh, showing that, uh, showing some counterpoint.